Hello, so welcome to the testing and continuous integration module for the Brenac School. I'm François Pogam, and I'm going to present to you uh, this module. So let's begin. To first, the outline. So first, there is a quick presentation about uh, testing and continuous integration. Oh, wow, how surprising. And then in the second part, we'll do uh, uh, hands-on and practice both uh, with uh, toy example of a script uh, which contains function and we'll write tests for those functions. And we'll uh, set up uh, GitHub Actions to automatically uh, run those tests when we push uh, to our repo. So first, let's talk about testing. So testing. Testing what? Obviously, it's testing code you write for your analysis or whatever you're developing. So always when you code stuff, you won't test it. So for some obvious reasons, maybe some less obvious reasons. So what is the purpose of testing? So here is a non-exhaustive list of reasons why you want to test what you're doing. Most obvious one is the first one, verify, verify your tool doesn't crash. Like, yeah, does it run? Does it actually do something? Um, if it do run, you want to make sure that when you give an input, it gives the output you're expecting. So if the function is supposed to do a specific math function on my input, like did I properly implement the math function so I can compare a pair of input outputs I know like go together, so I give the input to my function, I check the output, I compare it to the expected output, yeah, very simple. Um, maybe sometimes more tricky situation is with uh, corner cases or edge cases. So when you code, uh, your, you implement your math function, for example, you, you maybe you assumed that you will use it with like positive integers and then you give a negative uh, integer and everything breaks. For example, if you like write something with a square root of a number, and then like somehow you want to apply this function to a negative number, boom, you break, um, you are breaking mass and oh, uh, mathematics cannot help you anymore because you're doing uh, forbidden stuff with negative integers. So you want to make sure how you handle those cases. And sometimes it's just about like just checking your input and checking, oh yeah, if it's positive, do the stuff. If it's negative, then raise a warning about telling the user, oh no, you cannot use this function with negative uh, integers. So sometimes it's as simple as just checking the input is in the proper form because maybe you know your code, so you will always give a correct inputs, but if you, uh, want someday, sometime, someone else than you uh, to use your code, you should expect them to try every uh, possible way of making it break. So you should restrict uh, uh, maximally your, your code and check uh, as much as you can your inputs to be sure you are in the right cases that you can actually handle. Uh, also, you may want to make sure the outputs are sufficient quality. So with quotes, because of course, quality is uh, lo depends a lot on your the, on the context of your code, on what you expect, etc. It can be qualitative. It can be maybe you have quantitative criteria. You may want to just check for whatever criteria you have the output that come out of your code. Evaluating performance. So once your code runs give proper outputs for uh, the right inputs, you may want to look at the time it takes to run. So because if, uh, if on a toy example, it takes uh, one hour to run, and then on your real data, it takes uh, two years, maybe then uh, that's a bad thing. So you want to evaluate performance, maybe to see if it's worth it or not to uh, improve your code and to optimize some stuff. Of course, you want to identify bugs uh, because bugs, uh, if they are easy, they make your code crash and then you catch it, you catch it uh, as soon as you, you try to run it. But sometimes you, have, sometimes you have more sneaky bugs that don't make your code crash, but make the output slightly different from your, what you expect to. So uh, you want to add it, identify those, those problems. But then when you've identified a bug, you fixed it does your fix um, 
have an effect, a negative effect on other parts of your code. Maybe it fixed one aspect, but like breaks something else. So you want to test that when you fix something, it doesn't break the rest and that it actually fixes what you're supposed to fix. And you may have other reasons. It's, uh, I said, as I said, it's not exhaustive. So now that you're convinced that uh, testing is a good idea, what kinds uh, what kinds of tests do do we want to write? So how are are they? What are the types of tests that are that exist and that are useful to us? So you can divide uh, the types of tests into two main categories: functional testing and non-functional testing. So functional testing mainly it is answering the question: Does it actually work? Does it run? So that uh, in that category there are uh, unit tests. So which means testing one small functional unit. So the smallest piece of code that you have, like one function, one class, one module, whatever, one thing, checking it independently from the rest. So I have one function, I check, I give it an input, I check the output is correct. Integration testing is to check if once you know that each of your individual uh, modules or, or blocks like work individually, you want to see if they work together. If like you have one input, one output of one block that's the input of the other one, like if you have a chain of blocks, like can your uh, like can the, can the information flow go through the block uh, chain uh, uh, easily or not? Like it, does it all work together basically? Uh, smoke testing, which is just like oh yeah, can I? run without having any crash so you just like have an example scenario and you check like if, uh, if it crashes or not and the regression testing uh, which is a, a specific case of integration testing it's uh, when you add a new block to your one new function one new module one new element to your code does it uh, work with the rest? Like, do, does it impact the rest of your code? So you have one new feature that you're tested. OK, your new feature works. But adding this feature to the rest of the code, does it create problems or not? And of course, there are other uh, kinds of functional tests. I just put the main one and the one we are interested in. But if you want more detail, so in the slides, there is a link on the source, and you can uh, have a more comprehensive list of uh, types of testing. And so for non-functional testing, so it's answering the question, now we know it works because it passed the functional testing. How well does it work? Like, uh, yeah, how well does it work? So the first and maybe most common uh, uh, class of uh, tests non-functional test is performance uh, testing, which is also called load or stress testing, which is looking the performance of your code. So uh, most of the time it means uh, how fast does my code run? So you want to have decent timings uh, because uh, yeah, for it to be useful in real life. Um, but also it can uh, mean how much memory does my code use? Uh, like, can it run on my own machine? Do I need a supercomputer uh, with uh, like the highest levels of memory uh, to run it? Or can it run on my laptop in a decent amount of time? Volume testing um, is a test. So maybe it's not that relevant to us, but uh, it's it could be called a uh, scaling testing. So if you test your code on like one sample and it works, does it still work? And by work, I mean not necessarily crash, but like does it still run like in a decent amount of time uh, if I give it multiple samples? So the, the more um, obvious example of that it would be like, oh, you create an app uh, for people to, I don't know, uh, see uh, the, the forecasts and you have 10 users and it works perfectly, it's fine. Yeah, you say all, all my tests pass, but then your apps become super popular and you have 1 million users. And then maybe all your servers like come down because there is too much load on the servers. So 
uh, volume testing is like in advance, even if you have just 10 users, you check like, oh yeah, let's artificially create like 1 million uh, requests to my server, can it handle it? So this kind of question. So for scientific, uh, maybe it's not super relevant to scientific work, but uh, you can have some similar ideas with like, oh, my code like is used to clean uh, fMRI uh, scans. Like, oh yeah, it runs easily with one scan, but if I have like 1000 scans, like does it still run uh, and like, does it make my computer uh, catch fire or not? Uh, compatibility testing, it's like, oh yeah, I developed this cool code on my machine and you want other people to be able to, to, to run it and to use it in their own studies, but can like you develop it in a specific platform and can they actually use it on other platforms? So you're on Linux, uh, your coworker is on Mac, like is your code compatible with his machine? And install testing is even more straightforward is, oh yeah, can someone else and you <laughs> install what they need to run your code? Or do they have to do some dark uh, magic to like have everything to come up so that your code runs? Um, so here are uh, some descriptions of uh, that I already mentioned of different kinds of tests, but so that you can have it on the slides if you want to look at it later. And here is a <laughs> funny meme, like to stress the difference between unit tests and integration tests and why, because people are usually, it's easy to do unit tests, so people usually, if they do tests, it's unit tests, but not necessarily do integration tests. So to motivate people to do both kinds, uh, it's a situation where like both unit tests passed because both drawers function as drawers, like you can like individually from the rest of the the furniture, you can like the drawer functions, it can open, it can contain stuff. But when you put two drawers together, one is prevented the other from opening. So then the integration test uh, is failing. Okay, so now, now we are convinced, convinced that it's a good idea to do tests. We know it's a good thing each time we write some code, we want to test it. But where do we put those tests? Where, where do we store the tests? So the first idea would be you make dedicated modules and functions for the tests alongside your main code. So you have your main code and in the same files you, 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 you put your tests. So for example, each time you define a function like accompanied with the function there is like, oh, the test function, that test the function you just wrote. Um, that's a way of doing that, but the, the way I prefer to do it is with external scripts. So you separate the testing code from the original code or the main code of your project. You put them in a separate folder with tests, and in those folders you have all the tests that you use to test all the actual code you, you've written. So that's the way we're going to do it in the hands-on uh, with the PyTest uh, Py um, package. Uh, so we will just have a, yeah, a directory with the tests and the PyTest package will just grab every file in the directory and run all the tests. Another thing you could do is an example workflow. So that's a very good idea if uh, you develop a tool that you expect other people to use. So I don't know, you, you made a super pipeline of denoising uh, fMRI data and you want everyone in the world to use it. Well, the, maybe it's a good idea to have like example uh, data that you, you, you provide to the user so that they can, once they have everything installed, they can just try out on this example and you give them the expected output that they have so they can see, oh yeah, everything's working on my machine. It does the, the actual thing it's supposed to do. Uh, if you're super fancy, you can do executable documentation. So, it means that first you need to document your code, but you always need to document your code. So that's a non-issue. But uh, you can have like tools to put your code inside, like uh, automatically like have uh, web pages uh, with, your, with your documentation. And if you're super fancy, 
like generating this documentation triggers things to like actually test everything that put in the documentation. But uh, yeah, that's uh, super nice and super fancy, but it's maybe a, a bit uh, too much work for us. So we'll uh, stick with the external, external scripts. And uh, the last way you might want to do that, you do this test is have like a separate pipeline, even maybe with separate hardware to just run uh, and evaluate performance. So you, you, you have like uh, uh, a pipeline on a specific machine with constraint on speed memory and you, you, you use it to evaluate so the, the code you wrote to see if it works on the target uh, device. So maybe that's more relevant if you write tests that are supposed to like be um, run on like uh, very small devices. Like if you have, I don't know, a, a, a Raspberry Pi that's like linked to an EG uh, helmet that people wear and then you want to see that your code, like maybe it runs on your computer, but maybe when it's on the Raspberry Pi, it doesn't run as fast or things like that. So you, you may want to have a specific pipeline just for that. But uh, when we write, we have our tests and the, the code of our tests, uh, then there is a sneaky question. But because our tests are also code, pieces of code that we wrote, so they are susceptible to crashes, to n not work pro um, as we want. So should we test our tests? And you can see that uh, there is immediately this recursive question that can like, and then do we test the test of our test, et cetera, et cetera. So that's not very uh, tractable or useful, but you may, a um, better way of seeing it is do, you, do we want to have um, metrics about our tests? And indeed, there are some tools, so we won't uh, touch them in the hands-on, but uh, it's better for you to know that it exists and it's a good idea to, to use it. But there are some uh, tools to check uh, maybe the main metric that's important for tests and that's the most commonly uh, checked is what's called code coverage test coverage or one of the two. And basically the idea is to check how much of your code goes through a test actually is run in a test. So you have the automatic tools that look at all your tests. They look at all your code and they say, oh yeah, this line it's run in this test. This line is run in this test. So you can have at the end a proportion of lines of your code that are that show up in one of the tests. And it can say, oh, yeah, it's very good. You have like 90% of your code is covered by tests. So like, oh, yeah, it's bulletproof. It's super nice. Or like, oh, no, it's just 10% of your code is is uh, covered by tests. It's it's, uh, it's super dangerous. And yeah. But yeah, it's up to you to decide what's your, what's your threshold. Maybe you just want to test a, a very critical part of your code and you don't uh, care about coverage. Or maybe you're... Uh, super good developer and nice person and you want everything to be covered by your uh, tests. So yeah. Uh, next part. Oh yeah. So now we have all our tests. Let's say we've coded all of our tests and we have a super nice coverage. We have like everything handled. But now each time we change a little piece of code, like each time we update something in our code, we have to run all of the tests again and analyze all of the outputs of the test again and like check everything. So if we are, if we were to do it manually, it would like take more time than actually updating the code. So like the more code you write, the more tests you have to run and then it becomes worse and worse and you end up spending all of your time just running the tests and that's not optimal because you want to focus on the main code and the test should be just here to like not as a bonus because it's necessary but as like a side thing that's telling you yay what you're doing is good so we don't want to spend too much time running the tests so how we do that well you, we automate the running of the tests and that's 
basically what continuous integration is. So continuous integration, basically yeah, you continuously integrate the tests in your workflow, I don't know, <laughs> but yeah, that's what it means. And usually it's represented with this kind of like a, a cycle loopy a shape. So let's describe what's going on in here. So the start of the loop is here. So you're on Git, you've like updated your local uh, code. Like you've made, I don't know, a bug fix. Like you update your code any way you want. You push your updates to GitHub. This will trigger the run, the running, the run, the running of unit tests. So here the symbol is for GitHub actions. Because with GitHub Actions, you can like automatically have GitHub run some code, whatever code you want, to run on your repo each time you like do something. So here we will the trigger will be like when I push some new code, run the tests. Then you have some code analysis. So you have a, a tool. I don't remember the name of the tool that this uh, logo represents, but you have a, a tool that analyzes your your code and that says, oh yeah. This is uh, maybe you can have like some more qualitative uh, assessment of is your code good or not? Like, oh, is there duplications of part of code? Or, oh, that's a bad idea. You should like, you could refactorize to have like one function instead of like rewriting the same code everywhere in your code. Or this part is too complex. Like if you have too much nested uh, loops or things like that. So it can have like, uh, it can give you an insight about the way you could improve the readability, the, the like, yeah, some aspect of your code. Basically, it's a machine telling you, oh, your code is bad because X and Y. So that's usually a bit frustrating, but it's a good thing to address uh, the machine's concerns. And then you have the coverage test. I mentioned it earlier. It's just, yeah, checking, oh, yeah, how much of your code is uh, covered by your tests. And yeah, so then, so that you can see and feel bad because Obviously, it's not enough, and you should write more tests, etc. But yeah, so that's the wheel. So when everything of those use, those um, tools have run, you have one big report that says, "Oh yeah, so those tests, have, those unit tests have passed. Those unit tests have failed. Uh, your code is too complex because you have like too much nested for loops. Oh, by the way, it's uh, you have just twenty percent of code coverage. It's uh, super bad. And then you have your report, and you're like, "Oh no," and you. Re, you fix everything, you resubmit uh, the fixes to have like all green lights on your codes and you, you fix everything. But when you're happy with all the reports, then you release. So you like publicly publish, maybe not publicly, but if you have a tool that's like publicly available in a pip package or whatever, you update your version with the one that like passed all the tests. So yeah, that's the principle of continuous integration. But in our case, so what we will focus on is just doing some unit tests uh, with GitHub Actions. So to summarize, so when you're doing a project, how do you want ideally things to uh, happen uh, when you, you prepare your project? So ideally, what you want to do is write the basic scaffolding of your project. So what is my project? What's the pipeline? Like, what's, what are the, the, the steps uh, of the code I want to, to write, uh, etc. When you have the basic structure of your project, before even like coding everything, ideally, immediately, you want to set up uh, continuous integration. Because the earlier, the, easy, the, is, the easier it will be to, to, to install it. It's not impossible. It's not, it's not like impossible to set it up afterwards when you have a, like a project that's already uh, big. It's just a little more of a pain to do it when you already have a lot of moving pieces. So yeah, it's, if you want to do as it should be done, you should do it uh, at the beginning of the project. So then, so then after you don't have to think about it too much. And also, it's an opportunity to. Uh, mentioned test-driven development. So the idea of test-driven development is because in that situation, what you can do is there are two ways of developing. Either you just like code the stuff you want to do and test them, or there is a reverse and some people are, say it's a better way of doing stuff. I, 
don't have a strong opinion on that topic, but you can do what's called test-driven development. You first write your tests, and then you write the code that pass the tests. The idea is so you first think, you first think about what you want your code to do. So I want a code that uh, I don't know standardize uh, and uh, and uh, resample the uh, fMRI uh, files. So I write a test that take a file and check if it's resampled at the proper resolution. And then I write the function that pass the test. So you first think about what you want to obtain and then you implement how you obtain it rather than just like resampling and then seeing what you want to do with it. So yeah, it's a, it's a way of thinking and, uh, and, and putting forward your development. Um, so yeah, you set up and install your continuous integration. Then, uh, then you 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 code. So even uh, so, with test driven or without test driven development. But each time you add a new feature to your code, so a new function, a new module, a new pipeline, a new block, a new whatever. Well, you test it. So you add the test that goes with that feature. So I write a new function. I write the test that tests this function. And Instead of running yourself the, the tests and rerunning the old tests and etc., you just like push a button, send it all to GitHub. GitHub runs all the codes and uh, the, all the tests, gives you a nice uh, report, and then you can see, oh yeah, pass, 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 fail, pass, 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 fail, etc. But while everything is running, you just go drink coffee. So it's life is nice and easy or easier. So that's it. Uh, so now let's uh, do the hands-on. So as I said, so first we'll uh, so we'll start with the repo. So we'll have to, to clone um, uh, the repo I prepared. So you should have the link in the page uh, description page of the of the module. And uh, so there is just one simple and dumb file that does like dumb things with uh, a nifty file. But we'll write pytest. We'll use pytest. Yeah, we'll First, write tests for the functions. We'll use PyTest to run those tests locally to see how it works. And then we'll set up GitHub Actions so that each time we push something to the, so you will have a fork of the repo. So each time you push something to your fork of your repo, it will trigger the action that will run the PyTest. And you can see like, oh, each, so the idea is yeah, each time you add something to update your, your repo, you can see if uh, it breaks things or not. So yeah, uh, that's it. Let's go with the hands-on. OK, so let's go with the hands-on. So the first thing you should do is to fork the repo mentioned on the web page. Have your own fork of it. And then uh, you should uh, clone the repo on your computer. So that's what I'm going to do. Here is a link to my fork of it. So it's cloning in a new uh, folder called testing CI module. So we are going to go in that folder. OK. And in that folder, we have a license, a readme. We don't care about that. But we have a main script and requirements. So the requirements are just the modules that are needed for the, for the script to run. But it's very simple. So there is just NumPy, Nibabel, and PyTest, so the one we will use for the tests. OK, so now I have the code. I can look at it in my uh, in my text editor. So here is the script, so the main script. So uh, there are four functions. Uh, let's start with the main function, which is the one that says what the script is doing. Print the average of the thresholded voxel value. So it takes a pass to an image file, so a nifty file in our case, and a float that is a just a threshold and it returns nothing, so none. So it starts by uh, extracting the data from the image pass, so the pass to the nifty file, it extracts the data. Then it thresholds the data with the second function, and then it gets the average with the third function and just prints a nice message with the threshold and the average value. OK, so and it uses the three functions that are um, written uh, above. 
So the extract nifty data, it just, it takes the path to a nifty file. It loads it with nibabel, so nib.load. It gets uh, the numpy array of the data with the methods uh, get f data from the e emg object and it returns the numpy array. The threshold data, it takes an numpy array and a float, the threshold, and it returns an numpy array. So it just threshold the data. So you get the threshold of data is the data where the data is inferior to the threshold. So you see here that there is a problem because uh, in the docs ring, it says above the threshold, but here it's uh, inferior to the threshold. So that's an issue that you can easily spot, but I had to make an issue somewhere in this code. So we have, we had at least one uh, test that will fail to have an example of a failing test. So that's on purpose. It's wrong so that we can catch it with our tests. And the third function is just getting the mean of a, a NumPy array and returning it as a float. And it's just calling the numpy.mean function. So it's a very minimalistic function. In reality, I wouldn't write a function just for that, but it, for the sake of the examples, I wanted multiple functions doing multiple stuff. So I added this function. Okay. And then there is a if name equals main. So when you call that script, we have a, a, an argument parser so that we can provide uh, parameters from the command line with flags, so emg flag and threshold flag. It parses the arguments and then it calls the main function with the arguments. So if you're not familiar with those kind of scripts with the if name equals main and the argument parser, I recommend you uh, check the Python script module of the BrainX school, which introduces those concepts. But here I'll go on and suppose that you know about that or you can just uh, like just uh, live with it and you'll understand as we go along. Okay, so we have the code. Uh, so we want to run the code. To run the code, we need the dependencies. So the first thing we want to do is to pip install those dependencies. But for that, what I suggest to do is to do a virtual environment. Uh, it's always a good idea to have uh, the dependency of your project independently for each project. So you separate environment, you have separate environments for each of your projects so that you don't mix the dependencies of different projects. For example, you could have one project that requires one version of Nibabel, another project that requires another version of Nibabel. So you want to have two separate environments, uh, one for each project. So we are going to do that. So with Python dash M to call the modules VN for virtual environment and we'll call the environment just env. Okay, so it run. Now if we do ls, we see that in addition to the files we already have had, we have a new folder that's called env. So the environment is created, but we still need to activate it. So we are going to activate it with source env slash bin slash activate. Poof, and now we have, uh, have uh, this that says that we are in the ENV environment. So we, we are in a virtual environment. Okay, so now we can pip install our requirements. Okay, pip install dash r requirements. Okay, so su successfully installed everything. Cool. And there is just a warning because we don't have the uh, latest pip version, so we can please the pip gods and just upgrade to the latest version of pip, if, even if we won't need pip uh, for the rest of the tutorial. But anyway, okay, so now we are ready to run some code. We have our environment, we have our dependencies, we have the code. So the first thing I want to do is just some kind of smoke test, it's just trying to run the script without any input. So I should, if I wanted to run it with a, like an, I, an image and putting a pass, but before even doing that, I will just run with the help, uh, the help uh, uh, flag to see if it can, the help flag should just show the help strings that are written here. So let's check that. And I have a lot of problem. Okay. Hmm. Oh yeah. 
because it's just Python that okay no it's not a problem it's just what I meant to do is Python main okay and now we see okay usage main.py and we have like optional arguments help show this message img pass to the nifty file thresh the threshold to apply to the image okay but it's it's a first test because uh, it's kind of a smoke test as I said because it still has to run through the script to see if something going wrong. So if I had like garbage somewhere in my script here and I try to do with help, you see that I have a name error because I defined or added something that is not defined. So here I have an error. So the running the Python dash dash help can help you just check if you have like syntax errors or like uh, Errors in your code. But here it's not the case, it runs properly. So now we want to test with some input. And uh, the first way is to, is to have a nifty file lying around your computer. So I happen to have one, but uh, don't worry if you don't have one, I'll show you a bit later a strategy uh, if you don't have uh, some data. But it happens that uh, in the parent directory, I have an example uh, file nifty. Okay, so I'll run Python main emg my example file. I'll put a threshold uh, stretch with like a, let's say for example 10, and it will take a few seconds to run, but if uh, it should run properly without giving any errors. And uh, yes, uh, so we have the message that it's supposed to print, the so mean of uh, etc. Here, mean of voxel value is above 10, minus 2. So you, you can see here that there is a problem because if all the values are above 10, the mean should be also above 10. So there is indeed a problem in our code. But we don't know where is the problem. So we want to put tests to detect where the, the problem is and to test uh, each part of our code. So that's what we're going to do now. So as I said, we are going to use PyTest. So the way PyTest work is that once it's pimp installed, you can just run the command PyTest and it outputs something. So you see test session starts, it collected zero items, no test run in zero seconds. So of course we haven't written any tests, so it couldn't run any tests. So PyTest can automatically detect tests in your folder, but uh, there are none, so it didn't catch any. So we want to create a new file to make the test. So the new file, so for PyTest to be able to detect the tests, the new file should follow one uh, naming convention. It should be either test underscore something or something underscore test. So in our case, we can create a file called test main.py. Okay, so now if I do ls, I see there is an empty file that's called test main.py. And I can just open it uh, here uh, in my editor. And now the strategy is, uh, I'm gonna split that. So that I have two files next one to each other. So now in this test file, I will write unit tests for each of the functions in my original file. So to test this function, I need to run it. So I need to import them from the main script. So the first thing I wanna do is imp actually from main, import extract nifty data threshold data and get me okay and now for each of the function i will write a test function which as with the, the name of the file the convention should be 
test underscore the name of the function or the name of the function underscore test. So let's go with test uh, extract nifty data. And here, so I want to test this function, but this function takes a pass to a file. So there are two ways to handle those cases. So either you have uh, um, you have a, a file that you, you 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 have on your computer and you use that in the test. So you hard code like I would say like pass uh, equals. Uh, Example file dot gz. But the problem with this method it's it requires you to have the file. So it means that if you you have this file should be everywhere you, you run the tests. So if you want GitHub to run to be able to run the test, it means you should upload this file with your code on GitHub. But GitHub is not done to upload data. You shouldn't upload data to GitHub. So another way is sometimes it's not possible because you want to test with real data, but another way is just to create fake data. So we can use the Nibabel uh, library to just create a fake uh, image file, uh, like just create an image object from random data, save it as a file and use that file for our test. Um, so let's do that. We import ibabel as nib. And we do fake image equals nib dot. Uh, and that's where I need to check on the internet because I don't remember how to do that. So I just nibabel right nifty object. Uh, yes, nibabel documentation. And you see that those, this is a kind of things that you don't have to remember by heart, you can just uh, always Google what you need. So for example, here there is an example where it creates from data uh, that it randomly generated. So let's just copy this. Actually not the import, I put it aside, but here is this. Uh, okay. Then I need dot save. Let's say here. Uh, test emg dot noi dot gz. Okay, and actually I have to keep image. Okay. Oh, even better. I give the string as a viable. Then I can say that's a loaded data equals extract nifty data from the pass. Okay. So you see, in the end, I have created fake data, created an image object with this fake data, used a path, saved this image in the path, and then I reloaded the data. So now the obvious test is to check that the data, the loaded data is equal to the original data.
ओके सो द वे टू डू दैट टू वेरीफाई लाइक ट्रूथ ऑफ स्टेटमेंट इन विथ बाई टेस्ट इज टू यूज असर्ट स्टेटमेंट सो दैट वॉज आई एम गोन डू आई एम गोन से असर्ट numpy dot array equal so that the array equal is the function from numpy to check that two arrays are completely equal and i say data and loaded data okay i save that now here if i do py test So it found my test, but there was an error, and indeed no module named Nia Bell because I don't know how to spell so and write Nia Bell. Okay, now if I do pi test, I still have an error because no module named Nia Pi because I don't know how to write. Okay, now finally, yay! One test passed. So you see that it collected one item, one test, and the test passed. So no problem. So it detected that this is a test and that the test is uh, okay. And if I want to purposefully uh, fail the test, for example, here in the assert to show you how it looks like, if I add like one, so it won't be the same because it's plus one. And then you see, it shows me, oh yeah, where in the test it failed. So the, this assert, assert false. And it says like, oh yeah, so it tries to, to show the two arrays. But of course it's like, uh, the output is a bit garbage here, but it says to you, oh yeah, this is false. But you can also, uh, I think it's with a comma, uh, add an error message here. If I do that, so you see my message appears here and here. Yeah. So if you don't want to read all the like this, which can be a bit cumbersome to read, here you will uh, just have like oh yeah, the error message that I wrote here. Uh, so let's say loading. Incorrect. Okay, so that's for our first test. But uh, so let's continue with the other tests. So test uh, threshold data. Um, so here, again, I can create some fake data. Uh, let's say uh, numpy.random.randn. So it's give me a um, uniform sampling of values. And I can give it a shape, uh, let's say four by four. So I can define a threshold. Uh, let's say it's 0 0.1. And then threshold data equals threshold data of my data. And then I assert that uh, threshold data is superior to threshold. And so this, 
when you do that with this is an numpy array this is a value so this expression will output to you an array with with true or false at each of the values inside this array so this array is a four bar for array so if i have the first value that's above the threshold it will be true if the second one is false i have, I have an array with like true false false true for example but here i want it should be true everywhere so the way to do to check that with python is i take parentheses so i take the out the yeah the, the the output of this expression which is an array with true or false values and oh sorry and i call dot all so this is a method from for numpy arrays it's a bit like numpy array equal it's like it takes an array and if all values are trues oh sorry it will be true but if there is one false value in my array it will be false and again i can check threshold uh, thresholding incorrect okay third test is with the mean Actually, it's a better idea to have the full name of your uh, function here. K. Uh, let's say we have an array fi filled with ones. We get the average. is get mean of this data and since so numpy dot ones create an array filled with ones so we know for sure that the, uh, the average of ones should be one so we can check assert average equals one otherwise uh, mean correct okay so now we have our three tests Let's run them with PyTest. So here you see, so it, 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 it uh, collected three tests. So we detected all of our tests. Oh, and what fa one failed. And indeed, because I just made a mistake uh, writing it because the threshold data should take two arguments. So it says, oh yeah, missing one required positional argument threshold. So it gives us the, the error. Uh, yeah. And since, oh yeah, and since it's not the assert that failed, that's why we don't have the thresholding incorrect because the error is somewhere else. So let's fix that here. Threshold, save and run by test. And then we have what we expected, two passed in 0 0.16 seconds, one failed, and it tells us thresholding incorrect, a session error, and if we want more detail, we can see like the stack trace here with like the, oh yeah, it's here that it was, uh, that was a mistake, a session error, and yeah, everything here that we don't care a lot about. So, you see here, like that's the benefit of PyTest is that first benefit of PyTest is that it collects all your tests, it runs them, and then it gives you a nice report with colors about like what's passed, what's not passed. But it has also more powerful uh, uses. One, I won't uh, present every uh, features it offers because it would be too long and not very interesting. But one thing I like a lot about it uh, that, that actually, I actually use uh, in my tests and that can be of uh, use for you is that for our strategy of like, we created a fake uh, nifty file. Okay, that's great. But the problem is when we create that, it's, it sticks here. So we, we, we end up with garbage data that's here and that we don't really want. 
So one way of uh, handling that is that adding some code here to like remove the file. So like uh, calling OS system and doing rm for remove and this. And this would work, I, I think. Like if I do that and I do ls. Oh no, it's still here. Why is it still here? Hmm. Two failed. Okay. OS is not defined. Yes. Need to import OS, which is a package that's shipped with Python, so I don't need to pip install it. And now, just one fail to pass, and if I ls, I don't have my my uh, file because I removed it with this. Okay, but so that's the uh, ugly way of doing it because uh, you don't want to like keep track of everything that's everything that you you create and what you remove. And if you do a typo here, you could like remove sensitive stuff, etc. So you don't want to have to do it yourself. But fortunately, uh, uh, PyTest can do it for you. And the way it does that, so let's get rid of this ugly stuff, is with what's called fixtures. So you can give it, you can give um, inputs to the functions that uh, PyTest will by itself recognize and create uh, in consequences. For example, if I give it a temp dear argument, so PyTest will recognize that, oh yeah, this function takes a temp dear argument. So it means it, it should create a temporary directory that it will remove at the end of all the tests. So then you can just do whatever, put whatever junk you want in that directory and not care about it at all afterwards. So then way PyTest like uh, handles all the junks, all the junk uh, on its own and you're happy because you don't have to think about it. So here, uh, what I'll do is uh, still use OS actually because I'll use the os.pass.join. So that's a function that's used to concatenate uh, two paths together because I'll give it the name of the file and the temp dir here. So what this function does, it's, oh, this is a path, it's a temporary directory. So it's a path to the directory that PyTest will create for this test. And it will uh, add the test, Im test image, uh, any GZ name inside. Uh, okay, so basically if the temp dir is uh, my dir, okay, this function will return my dear slash test image uh, dot dot jz any jz or so that's what this function does it takes this it takes this and poof it puts it together nicely and then so if i do it like that uh, so you see, I don't have the garbage image here. And here I still have one fail to pass. And then uh, there is not the, the garbage image is not here. So it, it uh, removed it uh, safely. So that's uh, one thing I like about uh, PyTest is the fixtures. And if you want to see more about that, so here is the page with how to use temporary directories and files in tests. So you can do a temporary pass. Uh, temporary pass with fixtures, which will provide a temporary directory unique to the test invocation, which is the same. I use tempdir, but I, I think they are equivalent. Uh, it's the same. And then you can do more stuff with that. But I would suggest you go to the... Uh, 
if you want to check all the other amazing things that PyTest can do for you, you can check the, the documentation of PyTest. But here is my favorite because uh, it's an easy way to escape the need to like move data. Maybe you have like, if you work with a nifty image, maybe you have like huge images that you want to run tests on and it's a pain to like move them everywhere. So you can just like create some on the fly and then remove them when you're done. So that's a, a good way to do that. So uh, let's fix uh, or actually not, let's not fix our function because uh, uh, it's good to have like a mixed uh, test so we can see if it works on GitHub. But now what we want to do is go to the second part of the hands-on, which is uh, automating it. Because now, so what I could do is just as soon as I update my uh, code, I could just run PyTest each time and like I do a change to see if it passes or not. But I don't want to do that. I want it to be done automatically. So first thing to do is to actually push our test to our repo. So if I do git status, I see that there is a new file that's not tracked by git. So I will add the file and I will commit to the changes I made. So add and, I, and you always have to put a message. So the dash M is to say the message of your commit. So in this commit, what I did is I add the test. So I add this. OK. Now I push to the repo. Cool. So it's pushed. So uh, if I go to the page with the repo and I, now you see, in my repo, I have the test main.py. OK, so now I want to add uh, the GitHub Actions. So I do that. So you go, uh, um, go to the Action tab. So we'll start with uh, GitHub Actions. So we want to set up, so they call that workflow. So we're going to set up a new workflow. So you can either set up a workflow yourself and define everything yourself, but hopefully there are tons of preset uh, actions and like workflows that already made that uh, already have like the basic stuff for us. So for example, the one that corresponds to our need is Python application that's uh, suggested here. If you don't find it, you can search for it here. So we'll hit configure. And then, so it says workflow Python app. So we'll just call it run tests, but you can leave the name like whatever. Up run tests as the name. And then, so let's check a bit what it says. So you can define a name and like on is when it will be, uh, triggered, so when, when it will be run by GitHub. So on push, branches main, so when you push on the main branch, or when you do a pull request on the main branch. So if you want to do it on other branch, you can uh, add branch names. I guess you can, there's a way to say on all branches. Uh, permissions, it can read the content of our repo, okay. And the jobs, so the job is what it will actually do. So it will build our code. So we, are, it, we don't really have things to build, but it will install everything. So it runs on, so it will run on a virtual machine that will have the Ubuntu, Ubuntu latest, so on Linux. So it will uh, test on Linux, that's good to know. What steps? So it uses action checker v3 i don't really know about that but we don't care a lot so it will set up python so here you can change the python version you want if you want to test on a specific version or you can like repeat the test on multiple python version if you want to check like your code run on different python versions okay with python 3.10 then it will install the dependencies so it will upgrade pip installed Flake 8 and PyTest. So we don't, we actually didn't need to put it in our requirements because it will install it. If it finds a requirements file 
it will install the requirements. So good to know. Or otherwise we could have like written like help it install the requirements. Then it will lint with flake eight. So lint mean it will um, check the not the syntax but the like the aspect of the code. Like the do you like put spaces where you should put spaces? Do you like indent properly your code? Like all the like fluff that won't necessarily break the code but make it not look good. Okay, it stops the belief there are Python syntax errors. Okay, but then it will run the tests. So actually, we don't really need the, you could leave it, but here for the sake of simplicity, uh, we'll just leave the test. So it will just install the dependencies and run PyTest. Okay, so that's all we need. So we'll hit start commit. Okay, I'm losing my mouse. Yeah, so commit directly on the main branch, create run test. Okay, we don't need to put anything more here. And then, so we have a new, uh, a new, a new commit here. If we go back to the action tab, since we have a new commit. It's running the tests and it's running twice. I'm not sure why. Uh, and then, oh no, it failed. But we knew it will fail. It would fail because uh, if we look at it, so in the build, so it says here like the test with PyTest failed. And then you can look, so there is no, it's sad that we don't have the nice colors of PyTest, but you can see yeah, here, failed accession error thresholding incorrect. Okay, so now we can go back to our uh, code, finally fix our errors. And then when we go back here, git status. So here it said, oh yeah, we, you modified main. So we can git add the main script git commit and say fix thresholding git pull because you always need to pull before pushing I didn't do it last time because I knew there was not uh, changes there was no changes but here I pull because there is a, the addition of the run test uh, workflows. There is another one here, but it was just test I did earlier. So don't worry about that. And then git push. Cool. We wrote to main, but since we pushed, we can check in our actions. And it's doing twice each time. I'm not really sure why but it's running, it's running, it's running, and hopefully we will see a green check. Yay! Now you can check, and it says, yeah, it took 15 seconds, and you can have details about the PyTest, and it says, yeah, collected three items, three passed in like 0 0.17 seconds. So, Yes, that's it for this tutorial. So I hope you enjoyed it and you learned a lot of useful stuff, uh, basically. But he, when you're set up like that, uh, you're good to go. You can add uh, functions to your script, add tests, and don't worry about like running PyTest locally. Just push things and just think about checking the the output of the actions and check. Uh, maybe you can get notifications and set it up to get notifications like when it fails. So, so that if multiple people contribute to the same uh, repo, like uh, it tests everything people do so that you can know if someone else is breaking your code. Um, maybe one last thing I want to, to, to mention 
before uh, setting you free is the fact that so here the main and the test main the two files live in the same folder and that's okay for small small projects like it's okay to have just separate uh, having at least having separate files is okay i prefer that rather than having the test directly in the main file you could do that but i don't like it but a more elegant and even more elegant way of doing it is having a separate folder with the tests because if you have a, a complex project you want it's a bad idea to put everything in one file so you won't just have one main script and every function inside you know, you want to have multiple files with each having different functions or classes and spread around like a, with a more or less uh, complex structure if you want to do that then like you want to separate to, in a different directory your tests but then you want your test to be able to import the functions from your main uh, folder but as you might know in python you cannot import from a parent directory so the only thing that's visible to the test script in the import is what's in the same folder or subfolders in that folder so you cannot just like go one step before like from the parent directory of the te your test directory and then import so one the best way to fix that and i think you you if you have a big project you you will need to do that at some point is to make your project as a package it means that you'll have one directory usually it's named source but you can name it whatever you want when you put the code that you want to be able to import and you you install it as a package locally and then it's like any other package you do from anywhere any other script you will be able to do imp from src import uh, main dot uh, extract uh, whatever whatever or maybe from src dot main import uh, get mean or whatever so it will simplify your life a lot it will make everything a lot easier and it will be also easier to to handle with the, with the tests and we have uh, um, hopefully how how well the, the school is done uh, we we have a module just for that so you can check the uh, python package module uh, from Brainac school to to learn that so yeah if you are on more python right now and you want to go with another module right away i would suggest the python package uh, if you haven't done it already okay but that's all for me today and uh, yeah i hope you had fun and you you learned something and uh, i'm glad to have you and in, uh, in the Brainac school this year <laughs>